this episode, we'll be revisiting Margaret Beaufort. I have done this video before in the very early days of my channel. So if you want to watch that video, you are more than invited. But here we'll be digging deeper into certain details that I had not mentioned back then. Please sit back, take some coffee, tea, soda, and enjoy this new episode. Don't forget to like and subscribe and support me on my other social media. And also, I have a Facebook page called The Gothic Medievalist. If you want to follow me there for more memes and funny jokes, you're more than welcome. The love of a mother knows no limits. In the wild and throughout different cultures, we see how mothers stop at nothing to ensure their children can have a better life than they did. To the mothers who watch my channel, what will you do for your child? What sacrifices have you made for your children? I am not a mom, but I am the oldest of two children, and I remember my mother making several sacrifices for my sister and I. For the parents out there, this video might make you emotional and even disturb you a bit. It is no secret that the Wars of the Roses was an unsafe time to be alive. Just look at Richard, Duke of York, and the little royal family who suffered horrifying ends. This was the situation Lady Margaret Beaufort found herself in. The House of Beaufort was a quasi-royal family. The founder was John Beaufort, 1st Earl of Somerset, and they got their name due to their state of Montmorency Beaufort in Champagne, France. Since their early days, they were mighty and wealthy. But the birth of this cadet house was messy in the eyes of the nobles. They were the descendants of the illegitimate children between John of Gaunt and his mistress Catherine Swineford. King Henry IV decided that even though they were legitimate, they could not make any claims to the throne of England. So the Beauforts became dukes, counts, marquis, earls, and a baron. During the War of the Roses, the Beauforts were the chief supporters of the Red Rose and King Henry VI. One of their men even fought for Queen Margaret of Anjou in many battles. Margaret was born somewhere between 1441 and 1443. We do know she was born on the 31st of May, making her a Gemini, which, if you are into astrology, is quite fitting. Her background was pretty interesting. Her father was John Beaufort, Duke of Somerset, and his wife, Margaret Duchkamp. John passed away early in her life, and the reason for his death is still very much disputed. He had a fallout between him and the king, and he was banished. Some people say he died of illness, while the Crown Chronicles points to suicide. Her mother had involvement in her life, but not the type of involvement that perhaps she wished for. It was not uncommon for noble children to be raised far away from their parents. When she was one year old, the king gave her lordship to William de la Pole, the first Duke of Suffolk. To secure his own family's future, de la Pole arranged for his son John to marry Margaret, an arrangement that occurred when she was just a young child. This was all in the name of political power, as Margaret was the wealthiest girl in town. In 1985, historians John and Underwood wrote, quote, Upon in the unstable political atmosphere of the Lancaster court, end quote. So that makes us understand how people saw Margaret. She was a key, a pawn and very much desired by those around her for her wealth. She was either one or three when she married John de la Pole, second Duke of Suffolk, but three years later her marriage was dissolved and Henry VI granted custody of Margaret to his half-brothers, Jasper and Edmund. What is ironic is that even before her marriage to John, Henry was already thinking about marrying her to one of his half-brothers, Edmund Tudor, first Earl of Richmond. This is when we have to make a parenthesis to understand why this marriage was swept under the rug. According to medieval marriage law, a consummated marriage was legally binding. Nobles did not expect a toddler to go to bed with her husband. Therefore, these toddlers were somewhat married and expected that if things were according to plan, they would eventually consummate that marriage and carry on the legacy of their respective houses. 
However, as Margaret Life showed us, this did not come into fruition. Her marriage was dissolved due to these political tensions, the Lapole had a follow with the king, and life carried on for Margaret and her caregivers. The reason why Henry VI did, it, did this is still very much in the air. Henry and Margaret of Anjou wanted to strengthen the Lancastrian claim to the throne, and the best person they thought could do this, other than their own son Edward of Wandsminster, was Edmund. Remember, Edmund and Jasper were the children of Catherine of Valois and Odin Tudor. In 1455, all the treaties and bureaucratic processes were finalized, and little Margaret was set to marry Edmund Tudor. On the 1st of November, 1455, at the dawn of the War of the Roses, she was 12 and he was in his late 20s. This was a massive deal at the time. The nobles were very much concerned, and they were not concerned because they would have rather have their own sons standing next to her at the altar. They were actually concerned about the age. They thought she was way too young, and yes, 12 was the minimum age one could marry, but it was only decent that their husband would wait for her to be older, and the nobles had a hunch that Edmund was not that type of guy. We don't really know how Margaret felt throughout this. Her only comments on the subject were typical of her nature and personality. She was a deeply religious person, and perhaps her way of coping was through prayers. She expressed that she had a, a vision from God who told her it was her will to marry Edmund Tudor. The system failed Margaret, and the only thing they and everybody hoped for was for Edmund to be decent. Sadly, truth and reality are two different things. The wedding went ahead, and Edmund had the duty to protect the Welsh borders in the name of his brother, and Margaret went with him. Historians think that unless their child was premature, the date of conception was around April 1456. Margaret had become pregnant at age 12. The reason why Edmund did this is well known. He knew impregnating Margaret meant getting a huge blank check, and probably his children getting the throne. Besides, King Henry VI and Margaret of Anjou only had one kid to show for the mighty Lancastrian power, and Jasper Tudor was basically maidenless. For Edmund, decency was a social concept, and he did not live in society. The Jorks and Lancaster's tensions had filtered between London and the Welsh border. Edmund was captured in Wales and imprisoned, where later he died of bubonic plague, leaving Margaret a 13-year-old pregnant widow. The remnants of this scandal that it ensured remain with us these days in the form of witness statements by the ladies and those who were around Margaret at the time. She traveled to Pembroke Castle, the home of Jasper. No, not that Jasper. This Jasper. This was an extremely dangerous journey for a pregnant girl. Jasper hosted her in his house for the last few months of her pregnancy. According to the evidence, her birth was extremely difficult and traumatic. In her 2013 book, Blood Sisters, Sarah Griswood goes in depth into the birth of her child. It is believed Margaret was of petite size, mixed with her age and the poor medical knowledge of the time, this came to be a very dangerous mix. To everyone's surprise, Margaret gave birth to a healthy baby boy. Pagan tongues say the child had been given a Welsh name, but Margaret renamed her from his protection and honor for the Lancastrian king. The boy will be known as Henry Tudor. Cardinal and Bishop John Fisher paid a visit to her and said that he deemed it admirable that a baby could be born out of such a little person. All good, right? Margaret is wealthy, she had given birth to a healthy child, and survive to tell the tale. But this is when things actually get worse for her. So, she was 13, but she was cunning and intelligent and strategic. 
She knew that if she remained unmarried, she would be easy prey to the cattle vultures that were the Jorks and Lancasters. So Margaret and Jasper devised a plan to keep their heads on their shoulders, literally. Margaret could not do much without a husband, but she didn't need the money. She just needed a guy to stand next to her and say yes dear to her decisions. And something she wanted was to secure her lands and cash for her son Henry once she died. But she could not do this with Henry, so this is when Uncle Jasper comes into play. Margaret remained unmarried for the limited amount of time she could, and through this, she stayed with her brother-in-law Jasper. It was agreed that he was going to keep Henry and raise him when Margaret remarried. A year later, he helped her rearrange a marriage to just the type of man she was looking for. Sir Henry Stafford, the second son of Humphrey Stafford, the first Duke of Buckingham. Henry was a second son, so he was not worth much when it came to money, but he had just what she wanted, political influence and networking. The Staffords were in good standing with both their families, and despite Stafford fighting in favor of the Red Rose during the Battle of Towtown, he received a pardon from Edward IV and stood by him. This came with a high price for Margaret, though. Jasper had to flee and left the child in the care of Sir William Herbert. She also lost her lands, and they were given to the Duke of Clarence. Despite these setbacks, the marriage between Henry and Margaret seemed to be happy. She was never able to conceive again, but they used to celebrate their anniversaries with their friends and family. Margaret and Henry enjoyed their fortune and networking, and she had ingratiated herself to Edward IV and his wife, Elizabeth Woodville. In the 1470s, the Lancastrians rose again. Henry Stafford fought for Henry VI in the Battle of Barnet, where he died in 1471. By this point, Margaret was only 28 and a widow for the second time. However, she was pragmatic, and she knew she could not stay a widow for long. For a second time, Margaret told Jasper Tudor to take her son away, and he did, this man not seeing him for 14 years. Margaret met Thomas Stanley, Lord High Constable, King of the Isle of Man, and she married him in June 1472. He was everything that Henry Stafford was, but even more powerful because he did have the money. This marriage allowed her to return to the court of Edward IV and Elizabeth. In 1483, Edward IV died, possibly of pneumonia, and since his sons had conveniently disappeared in the Tower of London, their uncle, Richard of Gloucester, was crowned King Richard III. What Richard III thought about the Woodvilles, and that is Elizabeth and her family, can be described as thinking they were social climbers. That is because Elizabeth came from a family who, even though they were lower nobility, they were not the right type of nobility, and we've seen this over and over and over again in history. Also, Edward married Elizabeth in a secret ceremony. The only people who were present were her mother and her sister, and that did not fly well with Richard or even Warwick, the kingmaker. But Margaret knew she had to ingratiate herself to Richard, and she even carried her train in the coronation, so I think that is pretty amazing. By this point, though, Margaret was tired of not having her son by her side, which is understandable, so she began proceedings to negotiate his return with Richard III. We don't know exactly what happened or when it happened, but it is theorized that Margaret knew more than she let on about the disappearance of the princess in the tower. Or, at the very least, she knew that something sketchy had gone down. We could assume what happened, maybe Elizabeth and Margaret had some conversations, maybe some servants saw something, but indeed she definitely had a suspicion that Richard either had done something or he knew something. Because despite trying to negotiate with Richard III, 
the agreement to to have Henry Tudor return to live with her, she was also secretly communicating with Dowager Queen Elizabeth Woodville. It is believed they communicated through letters sent by their physician, Louis Carleon. They decided to build a plot to replace Richard III with Henry Tudor via a marriage with Elizabeth Woodsville's daughter, Elizabeth of York. So they started plotting and she was the mastermind behind the Buckingham Rebellion, to the point that she was called the Athena of the Rebellion. However, this was unsuccessful. Henry Tudor was supposed to arrive to help the rebellion and the fight, stuff happened, he arrived late, and Henry Stafford, the second Duke of Buckingham, was executed, and Henry Tudor was forced to retreat. Richard was absolutely shocked. He did not thought that she was capable of doing this, especially when she was married to somebody that he was trying to ally himself even more, Thomas Stanley. They had their own fallout, but he was trying to extend an olive branch, so he assumed that Thomas Stanley and Margaret would not dare to do something. Richard passed an act of parliament, striping Margaret of all of her titles and states, and declaring her guilty of conspiracy against the lord, so the king. Richard transferred her property to her husband. It is unclear if Richard knew or not, it is assumed that he didn't, but Thomas Stanley did not stop the correspondence Margaret had with Henry Tudor. She also continued plotting with Elizabeth Woodville, and during Christmas, Henry Tudor swore an oath to marry Elizabeth of York. Margaret and Elizabeth hoped this would reunite the houses of York and Lancaster and his rise to prominence posed a threat to Richard, who was convinced that Stanley was handling his missus. On the 16th of March, 1485, Queen Anne Neville died. Rumors spread throughout the country, either saying A. Richard poisoned his wife, B. The Lancasters poisoned his wife, C. The Woodvilles poisoned his wife in retaliation for the disappearances of the princes in the tower, or D, Richard poisoned his wife so he could marry his niece, Elizabeth of York. This gossip affected his own supporters, and the gossip reached Henry Tudor across the English Channel. Henry was extremely concerned about this news since losing his marriage would not only mean that he was losing the hand of a lady that he liked and would come to love, but also mean losing the alliance between the red and the white rose. Margaret and Henry knew this is the time to act because there was no way of debunking these rumors or even proving them at all. They could not take any chances. So with Margaret's money, he recruited mercenaries from France to supplement his own forces and set sail from France on August the 1st. Richard knew he would have to fight the usurper, Henry Tudor. He called for his forces at the Battle of Bosworth Field, and conveniently, guys, his ally Lord Stanley did not show up. However, despite Richard III not being built like an Avenger, he was no schmuck. Richard had battle experience, something Henry Tudor lacked. For all the faith that Lady Margaret placed on her son, he was unfamiliar with the arts of war and a stranger to the lands he was trying to take. His resume included such accomplishments as spending the first 14 years in Wales and the other 14 in Brittany and France. He was slender, but what he lacked in brawn, he had it in brain. Henry knew he was no god of war, unlike the past Edward IV or even the mighty Henry V, but he knew when to pass the torch. Henry recruited competent veterans to command his armies, amongst them John de Vere, 13th Earl of Oxford, who served as his principal commander. His presence in the battlefield concerned Richard III and his forces. Historians place the area of Ambion Hill as the regions where the two armies clash and even scenarios of engagement. King Richard sent a message to Lord Stanley, who ordered the Stanley family to raise men of the region to oppose Tudor. 
Once it was clear that Tudor was marching through Wales, Richard ordered Thomas to join him immediately. The Crayland Chronicles say Thomas told the king that he had tragically dies, tragically come down with a sweating sickness, which was a type of virus. Richard was many things, but he was not a moron. He knew Stanley was a traitor. So, Lord Strange, one of Thomas' sons, tried to run away from court, but he was captured by Richard and his men, and confessed that his father and his uncle, William Stanley, had been communicating with Henry all along. Finally, with all the proof he needed that his former friend was a traitor, he took Lord Strange as a hostage. Richard told Thomas Stanley that if he, that if he did not come right now, his son will be executed. Stanley replied, quote, Sire, I have other sons. And <laughs> Richard obviously did not take kindly to that type of betrayal. He did not take kindly to any type of betrayal, so he decided to kill Lord Strange. His supporters told him to wait after the battle since the fight was more important. So Henry decided to send messengers to Stanley to get his allegiance straight. Like, dude, if you're not going to support Richard, please come and help me, please. But Stanley replied evasively, and Henry knew that he would have to move on without him. Still, Stanley gathered his troops, the armies followed each other into the Midlands, Lord Stanley, Sir William Stanley, and Henry Tudor, and a host comprising his retainers. These were displaced Lancastrian exiles and men from Wales and Cheshire. It is believed that Henry and Thomas met before the battle to talk certain things out, but by the time they arrived at the village of Market Bosworth on August 22nd, they took a position independently from both royal forces. So what happened is we have the forces of Henry and the forces of Richard. Thomas Stanley was far away, observing everything. When the fight began, Lord Stanley took no direct part in the fight, standing on moving between the two armies when his brother William intervened to give Henry the victory. According to autopsy reports, Richard III received several injuries, many of them post-mortem. The fatal injury was found to be a blow to the back of the head, which sliced part of his skull off. Historians are not sure exactly what type of weapon was the murder weapon, but his injuries are consistent with a halberd, which contemporary sources in the form of soldiers do put in the battlefield near Richard at the time of his death. Polydor Virgil said Lord Stanley placed the crown on, of Richard on Henry's head and that the crown had been found near a bush. We have no form of actually proving if this is real or not, but if it's real, it's a pretty cool story. And if it isn't, it's still a pretty cool story. For her undying loyalty to her son, Margaret was given the title My Lady the Queen's Mother and a femme soul, a special permit that allowed her to own land in her own right, which it was what she wanted after all. She wore clothes of the same quality as Queen Elizabeth of York and Dowager Queen Elizabeth Woodville, and honestly, she deserves it. She had written her signature as M. Richmond since the 1460s, but by 1499, she changed it to Margaret R. It is believed this was to signify her royal authority but the truth is uncertain, as it could either mean Regina or Richmond. She also included the Tudor crown and the caption, and mother of Henry VII, King of England and Ireland. Beaufort was actively involved in the domestic life of his own family. She created a proper protocol regarding the birth and upbringing of royal heirs. Through their relationship is often portrayed as antagonistic, both Beaufort and her daughter-in-law Elizabeth worked together when planning the marriages of the royal children. They wrote jointly of the necessary instructions for Catherine of Aragon, who was to marry Elizabeth's son, Prince Arthur, 
both women also conspired to prevent Elizabeth and Henry's daughter, Margaret, from being married to the Scottish king at too young of an age. Beaufort said she should not share my fate, end quote. After Elizabeth's death in 1503, Margaret became the principal female presence at court. When Arthur died, Margaret played a part in ensuring her grandson Henry, the new heir apparent, was raised appropriately by selecting some members of his new household. Margaret herself passed away in on the 29th of June, 1509. This was the day after Henry VIII's 18th birthday, and five days after his coronation, and just over two months after the death of her son. She is buried at the Henry VII Chapel of the Abbey. So now that I told you about the life and death of Margaret Beaufort, let's talk about this really wild theory that I see around all the time in some forms. And that is that Margaret was the one who orchestrated the disappearances of the princess in the tower. This theory says that she had the wealth and the connections to bribe the guards of the tower to kill the children, so she could manipulate Elizabeth Woodville into marrying Elizabeth of York to her son Henry and pin it all on Richard, so since he was not a guy, he feared getting his hands dirty. The problem is, she has no motive, no motive at all, which seems weird because she would have wanted her son to be with her, but Margaret had been negotiating his return with Edward IV and Richard III. Pulling a fast one on Richard this way would have been a great way to get her killed and her son killed as well. So this would have been extremely risky and Margaret was a person who made calculated decisions. This would have been unwise of her to do so. Not only that, she was an extremely pious woman and harming children is not something that Margaret seemed to want to do at all. I guess it just had to be. Mm. Won't someone listen to me? I got the words, I got the tune. I'd like to croon it under the moon, but I got nobody to hear my song, so I'm humming to myself. 